Over the past couple of weeks, we've seen a new focus of Biden administration attention. It's not Hamas, it's something called settler violence. I'll explain what stands behind the headline and what it means about who's calling the shots on U.S. policy towards Israel and Hamas, coming up on In Focus. This morning, the New York Times ran a story that said that con- that members of what I refer to as the Hamas caucus on Capitol Hill are asking tough questions about an Israeli effort to purchase 24,000 assault rifles from the United States. Now, this isn't part of the $14 billion aid package for military supplies that Israel or that the Biden administration has submitted to uh, Congress for approval. This is separate. This is just... Uh, purchased by the Israeli government from uh, directly from U.S. contractors, like $34 million, 24,000 uh, rivals, something something along those lines. And uh, it, simply because Israel's a foreign government, it has to apparently uh, be reported or approved by the State Department and reported to the Capitol Hill. So apparently uh, the State Department gave it approval uh, and, get, and sent it to Congress just to update uh, legislatures about what legislators about what's happening. And this uh, caused a ruckus. People said, oh, no, 24,000 assault rifles. Where are they going? And the State Department said, well, Israel says it's going mainly to the National Police Force and it may also go to uh, uh, communities for uh, civil protection. Well, so the congressional uh, uh lawmakers uh, concerned about this, that may go to extremist settlers, and we don't want that to allow them to uh, get rifles because that's uh, settler extremism, settler violence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and apparently there are a lot of people in the State Department that are working with the Hamas caucus on Capitol Hill to block Israel from purchasing the 24,000 rifles. So this isn't that surprising because over the past several days and really over the past few weeks, we've heard more and more and more of this concept of settler violence, extremist violence from Jews in Judea and Samaria. Uh, President Biden talked about it on, uh, in his press conference with Australian Prime Minister Albanese at the White House on October 25th. Secretary of State Blinken talks about it all the time. He never stopped talking about it during his press conference last Friday in Tel Aviv. And uh, we just keep hearing it over and over and over again. Extremist settlers, settler violence, uh, violent extremism from Israelis who live in Judea and Samaria. And a lot of us uh, who live in Judea and Samaria, like, what are they talking about? We don't even know what they're talking about. What settler violence are they talking about? We know, I mean, I, I uh, was checking what, what the numbers were. So according to Rega Vim, an NGO that uh, deals with a lot of these issues, uh, um, just in the first six months of this year, so from January 1st to the end of June of 2023, there were the Palestinian terrorists committed 3,640 terrorist attacks against Israelis in Judea and Samaria. They led to... 28 uh, deaths of Jews and 362 injuries, various uh, degrees. And these attacks run the gamut from uh, roadside shootings, which is how most of the fatalities uh, were caused, to uh, stoning attacks, Molotov cocktails attacks, uh, riots, uh, knifing, stabbings, axings, uh, you name it. So that's just in the first six months of the year. And although the data hasn't been completely tabulated, uh, according to Regavim and other sources, there's been a massive uptick uh, in uh, Palestinian terrorist violence against Israeli Jews in Judea and Samaria since October 7th, since the uh, Hamas invasion and slaughter in southern Israel. So this is, there's a very large escalation. And... um, I'll just give you today a testimony that was published on, uh, on, uh, on social media from an IDF reservist who's been, who was called up on emergency orders in Samaria uh, shortly after October 7th. And so he wrote it in Hebrew, and I thought it was important enough to translate to English. So I'm just going to read you what this 
reservist wrote. He wrote as follows. The amount of shooting lasers, the wild behavior, that's high, high beam lasers, uh, that uh, terrorists point in the direction, in the eyes of Israeli soldiers, civilians, in order to blind them. It happens on the road to cause traffic uh, accidents, and it also happens in military operations. So, Kaha says, the amount of shooting lasers and wild behavior of the Palestinians here towards IDF forces shows that they are convinced they can do whatever they want here. It's simply unbelievable. Then he says the first two weeks after October 7th, the Arabs told themselves the Jews are for sure going to go nuts. Let's keep calm. And we had two weeks of relative quiet. That stoning attacks, no roadside shootings, no violent riots. Incidentally, this claim is uh, contradicted by other sources who say that's not true, that the violence actually started immediately after um, the October 7th slaughter. Uh, but all the same, that's his experience. He said, we had two weeks of quiet here, no stoning attacks, no roadside shootings, no violent riots. And then they saw Israel isn't doing anything to them and that we didn't initiate any serious action, that we're back in the terror containment game. We've seen terrorists, we, he and his fellow soldiers, we've seen terrorists with our own eyes and our officer told us, no, you can't initiate contact. They've run back to their village. We can't pursue them. We're not allowed. What does that mean? He, what does he mean that we can't go after them to their village? The soldier continues. That's what we said about Gaza because they were inside Gaza until they went out of Gaza to kill us. What does it mean that we can't go after them in their villages to block them from coming into ours and killing us? Then he goes on. Central Command doesn't care. The Arabs are rioting here. They enter our communities. They do whatever they want. They shoot into our communities. They openly conduct surveillance of our communities. They use lasers to blind our soldiers in our positions. They're endangering highway traffic by deliberately driving recklessly. I can attest to that. The day is fast approaching where we will start suffering massive attacks here. No one in the IDF is initiating any action to prevent this. No one is taking it to them. No one is going crazy in their villages and isn't showing them that we're in charge, so they're emboldened. And now they have this fantastic model to follow, Gaza. They're openly organizing to do a redux of the Kibbutz Be'eri massacre against the residents of Judea and Samaria, and the IDF isn't doing anything to prevent it. We soldiers are walking around humiliated and frustrated. We're armed and we're wearing body armor and everything. And despite that, the only ones who walk around with any confidence are the Arabs. They smell our weakness and understand that they have the upper hand. It is going to explode on us in a massive scale. What is going on here? Well, it works out that this isn't by chance. Everything that we're experiencing on the ground in Judea and Samaria, the laser attacks, the, uh, the undercover of the olive uh, harvests, uh, which I'm going to get into in a second, surveillance of communities, axing attacks, riots, and other things against Israelis, and then, boom, uh, these accusations of settler violence. Nothing is happening by chance. Um, it works out that much of what we're seeing on the ground is organized by an organization called the International Solidarity Movement, which is funded, among other places, by the Muslim Brotherhood and specifically by Hamas and the Hamas branch in Europe. Uh, and attesting to that, we have uh, um, a, we have a video that was put out several months ago by the Odd Khan undercover investigative uh, organization that managed to put one of their members into ISM uh, essentially as a as an agent or a spy that was um, that was uh, secretly filming what was happening, and so. Here, I just want to show you uh, Paul Arruti. He's an American citizen. He's born in Iran. He actually is very aligned with the Iranian regime and the Syrian regime. Um, and he is the head of ISM in Northern California and really one of the leaders of ISM in general. And here he is talking about the October 7th slaughter by Hamas. My name is Paul Larudi, and I am the North American General Coordinator for the Global Gathering in support of the choice of resistance. Today, our Palestinian brothers and sisters are teaching a lesson to the Zionists. They are teaching them that they are not merely stones and scorpions that must be cleared from the land in order to fulfill the racist Zionist dream. Every tank and missile in the Zionist arsenal is food 
taken from the mouths of our children, not only the children of Palestinians. Our, our Muslim brother, the, the money, the money. Uh, the person to connect you with might be uh, Zahir Badawi. Is he an Muslim brother? He's affiliated. He doesn't say he's, he's in it, but okay. he says he's affiliated. Okay. He, knows, he knows the people there. He knows the people. In, okay. He knows the uh, leadership in, in Gaza. Okay, so here's Paula Rudy. Um, praising the Hamas terrorist attack against Israel, and we had it coming, and uh, we deserved it, and this is a glorious thing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. so he's applauding it. And this goes then to what's happening in the South Hebron Hills. So Hamas, of course, took a PR hit with, you know, beheading babies and burning them to death and raping women and burning them to death and dismembering families and killing them and all the rest of it, and then taking 240 Israelis hostage to Gaza and doing God only knows what with them, but we certainly know that the Red Cross isn't being uh, given permission to visit any of them. And from the footage that we've seen, um, this these are crimes against humanity that were carried out on October 7th, and every single second that our uh, citizens remain captive in Gaza is another second of a, another crime against humanity. Um, so we see that that's what's happening. That's kind of a PR hit. It's sort of bad. You know, a lot of people are upset about that. So they have to have a counter assault. How do they get a moral equivalence between uh, Hamas, which is slaughtering babies, raping women, burning people to death, etc., cetera, uh, killed 1,500 Israelis, took another 240 captive. You know, we've only buried out of the 843 uh, civilians that were that were clear are, were killed, we've only buried like 740 because we can't get them enough together to actually bury them because they've been so devastated, the bodies. And we talked about that last week with uh, Avigal uh, uh, Gimpel, and you should check that out if you haven't seen it. At any rate, so um, how did they compare what they did to Israel? Well, it's simple in a way, which is because lots of people want to believe that Israel's bad. So they start this massive PR campaign to demonize Israelis, and specifically the Israelis everybody's used to hating is the settlers, the extremist settlers, the violent settlers, the ones who commit settler violence, and they're extremists. So here now I'm going to show you another clip. And in this clip, which was filmed by an ISM activist named Allison Russell on October 25th, uh, in the South Hebron Hills. So the South Hebron Hills is an area just south of Hebron. It's a strategic area because it kind of uh, provides territorial contiguity between uh, Judea, South Judea, and then through Judea up to northern Samaria, and the Negev, the Sinai Peninsula, and Gaza. So it's sort of a, it's it's the way to, com to combine or to uh, to attach uh, Judea and Samaria to the rest of the terror complex in Sinai, uh, in the Negev, um, and, um, and most importantly today, to Gaza. So the South Hebron Hills has always been viewed as a strategic target by the Palestinians to try to take over. So they've built illegal communities in the middle of firing ranges of IDF bases, and they've carried out a multi-year campaign to try to demonize the Jewish communities in, for instance, Susia, which is an ancient Jewish farming community um, that was destroyed by Muslim conquerors around the uh, 8th century, the first Muslim uh, invasion of Israel. At any rate, so uh, this is their hub of operations. And in the clip that I'm going to show you, which was taken on October 25th, by and, and their, most of their volunteers, most of their activists in Israel are either Israeli radical leftist anti-Zionists who live, many of them, in, or two out of three anyway, live in Arab villages. And um, one of them, I for sure, named Neta Golan, is married to an Arab. Um, and Or they're from Western countries. So the clip that I'm going to show you was uh, filmed by an ISM activist named Allison Russell. And in it, we're going to see two other ISM activists, one named Mike or Mick Bowman and an Israeli ISM activist named Yasmin Elan Vardi. And they, together with others, are attacking an Israeli military position outside of the Ma'on 
uh, community in the South Hebron Hills. It's a it's an agricultural community. Um, so they're attacking. They they go and they attack the soldiers. This is before what we're seeing filmed. And then what we see the clip that we're about to see is when the reservists who are manning the uh, military post come out to um, to try to arrest them, to try to take action against the uh, anarchists, the uh, terrorism supporters or whatever, or terrorists, whatever you want to call them, who are attacking their position. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. Okay, so what happens is after this clip, uh, after this clip is taken, uh, Allison Russell posts it on her Facebook page. Later that day, October 25th again, it's posted by the head of the um, European, the German funded, the New Israel Fund funded, Ford Foundation funded anti-Zionist organization Breaking the Silence. So the head of Breaking the Silence posts it on her Twitter feed. And then um, later that day on October 25th, President Biden has this press conference where he talks about extremist violence of Jews uh, in Judea and Samaria, and he refers to these extremist uh, settlers as people who are pouring gasoline on a fire, okay? So this is just hours after ISM uh, provokes uh, IDF forces standing outside protecting the Maon farming community in the South Hebron Hills to come out and respond after they were attacked by these ISM, Hamas-funded ISM activists operating uh, in the South Hebron Hills. They attack the Israeli military checkpoint. Oh, and the one very key thing is that in, in Allison Russell's uh, post and then also in the uh, Breaking the Silence post, they don't refer to the defenders of the Mullen Farm as IDF forces, even though you can see in the clip they're all wearing uniforms because they're IDF reservists, um, they refer to them as settlers. So they call them settlers. They say that they're being attacked by settlers, even though what they're being is they're being, uh, they're being confronted by IDF forces who they just attacked. So they just attacked them. IDF forces come out, and when they present it to the world on their Facebook posts and on their Twitter posts, um, they refer to them as settlers and they say that this was unprovoked, that this is just aggression by settlers who are coming out and attacking these poor ISM volunteers. Incidentally, ISM has a long history of cooperation with terrorist uh, organizations and even with committing terrorism themselves. For instance, famously, the Mike's Place bombing in Tel Aviv right underneath the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv in 2003 was carried out by two British uh, terrorists who entered Israel as part of an ISM delegation, so that they were either members of ISM in Britain or they joined an idea ISM delegation to come here and carry out a terrorist uh, suicide bombing uh, uh, adjacent to the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv. At any rate, so, and that's just one. There's a whole slew of other attacks where, uh, that involved ISM members uh, since then. Um, at any rate, so Biden uses the same language, essentially, as Allison Russell and is breaking the silence do in their post. And how does this happen? Well, they have representatives in Washington contact the State Department, no doubt show them the footage, and... Within just a few short hours, it went from a provocation of IDF reservists at, outside of my own farms to Facebook, Twitter, gets sort of, if, if ISM is considered kind of edgy, breaking the silence is supported by left-wing progressive Jews in the United States, the German government, the EU, and other foreign groups. Uh, they pick it up, they cashier it, so to speak, and then it goes to Washington Washington, it goes to the State Department, State Department goes to the White House, and it comes out of Biden's mouth that evening in a, in a, press, uh, in a press conference with Tony Alba Albanese, uh, the Australian uh, prime minister. And uh, in the meantime, we had on October 29th, so after Biden opens up the initial volley against the settler violence, we have a statement uh, signed by 22 NGOs funded by uh, Western governments, the New Israel Fund, Ford Foundation, and all the rest of it, 
call titled Emergency Call to the International Community Stop the Forcible Transfer in the West Bank, uh, Dateline from the South Hebron Hills on October 29th. We, the undersigned human rights and civil society NGOs in Israel, call on the international community to act urgently to stop the state-backed wave of settler violence, which has and is, which has led and is leading to the forcible transfer of Palestinian communities in the West Bank. All right, Palestinian farmers. I'm going just uh, going over something because it's boring, but. Palestinian farmers are particularly vulnerable at this time during the annual olive harvest season because if they're unable to pick their olives, they will lose a year's income. So that's not true. That's not their primary source of income, but whatever. So the why, why is it important that they're talking about the olive harvest? I said I'd get back to it. All right, so <clears throat> the olive harvest. What, what we've been seeing, what I've been seeing over the past several days is more and more reports of very aggressive uh, groups of Palestinians uh, coming up really to the fences of the perimeter fences of many communities from north to south, from Samaria down to the South Hebron Hills under the guise of the olive harvest. So three weeks ago, this happened in uh, the Benjamin region. There were uh, two uh, Israeli Jewish shepherds who were out tending their flocks and uh, under the guise of the olive harvest, this mob of Palestinians holding axes came and began attacking them. And one was moderately injured and one was critically wounded in this terrorist attack. And then I think it was last Shabbat, there was a soldier, I think I spoke about this last week, there was a soldier on furlough from uh, the IDF with his family on Shabbat, and they were walking through the family's uh, orchard just outside of the gates of their community of Rechalim, and they were beset also by axe-wielding Palestinians, and the soldier shot in the air, and the Palestinians claimed that he killed one of the people, and there was a whole uproar on Shabbat to the point where Samaria Regional uh, uh, Council head Yossi Dagan got a rabbinical permission to the, 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 of the chief rabbi of Samaria to give a statement to the media on Shabbat explaining what had actually happened because immediately all of the reports started coming out on Shabbat that a settler had murdered innocent Palestinian harvesting olives. So that was last week. And then this week we've seen over this past Shabbat, so that was Shabbat nine days ago, and this was this last Shabbat you had shooting into Rechalim, also under the guise of the, uh, of the uh, olive picking. And then... Over the past two days, uh, or three days, the community of Migdalim, also in northern Samaria, has been subjected to very, very aggressive surveillance um, and uh, devastation of olive groves by people claiming to be olive harvesting. But what they're really doing is setting up surveillance posts outside of uh, the, the community of Migdalim. And this has been going on now for two days. Yesterday, a neighbor of mine said that we had the same thing happen in Gush Etzion, outside of the community of Neved Kalim, that you had a very large group, un un unreasonably large group of people claiming to be uh, coming to the fields to har harvest the olives, and they were conducting surveillance and uh, coming right up to the uh, uh, to the community fence of the community of Neve, da Neve uh, Daniel in uh, Gush Etzion, uh, supposedly to harvest olives. And uh, so, and then in the South Hebron Hills, it's happening uh, in a very aggressive way as well. Outside of the uh, community of Kedumim, they saw people with binoculars, just, you know, meters from the fence looking in. And then some of the people who have been arrested have been shown to have apps on their cell phones that are in Hebrew that give all of the information about what's happening inside of all of the communities that they're surveying, who lives where, who, who lives in what a house, who, 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 is, uh, who are the leaders of the community, etc., so that they're having people's addresses, they're mapping out these communities, they're testing and they're checking the defenses, where are their holes in the fences and where are they not, and they're taking pictures of it all. So this is this is happening, and and then um, so that's one of the things that's happening. 
Uh, so this is under the olive harvest thing that everybody in these 22 groups, including, by the way, um, a land for all two states, one homeland, Akivot, in Amnesty International, Association for Human Rights, for Civil Rights in Israel, B'Tselem, Beam Comb, Platters for Civil Rights, Breaking the Silence, Combatants for Peace. Um, these are all radical leftist organizations. Women Lawyers for Social Justice, Dear Amim, Jordan Valley Activists, Karim Navot, Mahsoum Watch, Mothers Against Violence in Israel, uh, Another Voice, Parents Against Child Detention, Physicians for Human Rights Israel, Policy Working Group, blah, 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 blah. Lots and lots of different ones. Uh, Zohrot. 22 groups. So anyway, so um, that's what's happening. They're conducting surveillance of Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria under the guise of the olive harvest. And uh, when any action that Israeli forces or Israeli communities take to try to push them back are immediately filmed, posted online, as settler violence against the Palestinians that uh, the U.S. then comes in and attacks and condemns and says that Israel has to take action against the perpetrators. But the perpetrators are actually ISM volunteers or activists that are coming in from abroad uh, to provoke violence that then Israel responds to. And then they, they tell everybody that the response is actually the provocation that they, and, and not the other way around. So, and in all of these cases, according to uh, a lot of the uh, community leaders who are on the scene, and this has been said for many months, actually, but that every time that there's a Palestinian provocation um, like this, and IDF forces respond, or first response teams inside of the communities respond, you have a situation where um, a complaint is made to the U.S. side of the ISM uh, organization operating in Israel. They call up people like Paula Rudy, and there are other lobbyists and activists in the United States who then call their friends in the State Department. The State Department then calls directly to Central Command, which is run by Major General Yuda Fuchs, who was Israel's military attache in Washington before he received his appointment to head Central Command. They call him, and then his office calls down to the battalion commander on the ground, says, what are you guys doing? And then everything stops, and these people are allowed to go back into their village, just like the reservist attested to in his uh, frustrated, angry, concerned testimony that was published online this morning by uh, uh, by Ayelet Lash on her Facebook page, who's another activist. So... Obviously, all of this needs to stop. You know, the, the Senate House should really start investigating the ISM, should be investigating the State Department's links to these organizations that are funded by Hamas, that are aligned with Hamas, that are working with Hamas, uh, and then being used as mouthpieces for their messages, their anti-Israel messages that then get parroted not only by President Biden, but by National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan and Vice Secretary of State Tony Blinken, not to mention parroted like throughout the news cycle by all of the mainstream media. And even I see in the Wall Street Journal this morning, there were two articles that I read that were referring to settler violence and uh, and and another uh, ostensibly conservative uh, news sources that are all parroting these talking points that are being created by terrorism boosters operating in the South Hebron Hills and more broadly throughout Judea and Samaria in order to demonize Israel as a means, again, to develop a fake moral equivalence between Israel on the one hand and these slaughterers from Hamas on the other, these rapists, these child molesters and murderers uh, from Hamas on the other hand. So obviously this could use a, an investigation by lawmakers who are not members of the Hamas caucus uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, and uh, one more word about that, just to just for just for noting. Um, I'll just go back here. Ah, yes. So uh, when I was preparing this monologue, I was looking at ISM's page on uh, NGO Monitor, which is really important uh, organization that you should check out to see all of the governments that are funding 
these uh, anti-Israel terror booster organizations. So on the ISM page from, I, from NGO Monitor, it shows that ISM was actually under FBI uh, terrorism investigation between 2004 to 2006, probably as a result of the Mike's Place bombing, which again, uh, Mike Bla Mike's Place in Tel Aviv was located adjacent, literally adjacent to the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv. So this was clearly also directed at the United States of America. And so the FBI was investigating ISM. So how did ISM respond to this? Well, they developed lobbying operations in Washington, D.C., and now they have all of the representatives from the Hamas caucus in Washington that's always happy to parrot their talking points. And apparently they also have people like Hadi Amar, the special representative in the State Department for the Palestinians who has legion ties with Hamas, who are also parroting their talking points. And then we hear them in speeches again by principals, by President Biden, by Tony Blinken. So, um, FBI, reasonable terrorist booster funded by Hamas, European, uh, European branch, ISM, and, um, they could open an investigation, for instance, now, which would be great. Um, and then one more word. So the Biden administration is saying settler violence, and then they're saying that what we need is a two-state solution. And when Blinken was here last weekend, he met uh, in Ramallah with Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, the head of Fatah, the head of the PLO. And he talked about how America seeks a two-state solution and that the United States is keen to see Abbas come with the Palestinian Authority and take over Gaza on the backs of our soldiers who are now dying to, in, in our war to, to defeat Hamas, to annihilate this, uh, this Islamo-Nazi organization. And so what, what Blinken wants to do is get us to free Gaza from Hamas um, but he wants us to then give it to the PLO. So just a couple of words about that brilliant concept. So I've spoken a lot about how much the PA is supporting Hamas, how it's acting as Hamas's foreign ministry and, and defending Hamas at the UN and attacking Israel in the name of Hamas at the UN and in all the international community and capitals around the world through the PLO ambassadors. So just uh, Macquarie Schoen reported today, Monday, that um, yesterday, PA military commanders in Jenin, and I don't know if you remember, but Israel carried out a counter-terror operation in Jenin, which was run by Islamic Jihad and Hamas. So uh, we pushed them out of the what's called the, the, the refugee camp in, in uh, Jenin. And um, then the United States demanded that we transfer control over the city to uh, PA Security Services and Yuda Fuchs, who's always happy to help them, uh, did just that. So PA Security Services came into Janine, took over for the first time in many years. Um, and those same U.S.-supported uh, Palestinian Security Services just gave an ultimatum to Mahmoud Abbas yesterday. It said, you have 24 hours to declare war on Israel and to join the jihad against Israel. And if you don't, then we're going to go into open revolt against you. So that was nice. And then the other thing was that in Hebron, so Janine is in the north and Hebron is in the south. In Hebron, the Al-Aqsa Brigades, which is a Fatah terrorist organization um, that is controlled by the Palestinian Authority. Anyway, so the, the Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, Fatah's organization, again, controlled by Mahmoud Abbas, just uh, put out the statement to its members. We have lots of weapons. We've gotten a lot of new weapons, and we want to start doing active attacks against Jews. Come join the jihad. So that came out, I think, yesterday as well. That was in the Macquarie Shun report today. So, so that's the PA. That's the security services that the United States supports moving from uh, Judea and Samaria to Gaza on the backs of our soldiers because they need a two-state solution, and the moderates and the Palestinian society are, of course, the PA, and, you know, they, they believe in Abbas, who doesn't control anything, including his own forces, uh, and he's going to somehow or another uh, build a Palestinian state that's going to be, uh, that's going to be at peace with Israel, the same Mahmoud Abbas that, you know, it has... Is, is like a Nazi anti-Semite. He denies the Holocaust. He said uh, that Israel's responsible for what happened on October 7th. And, 
you know, his people support October 7th, Muhammad Shtaya, his prime minister. I talked about this last week as well. He said they want to form a unity government with Hamas after the war is over, and that Hamas is really great, and they love Hamas, etc. So, um, so that's the whole thing. So it starts in the South Hebron Hills with a provocation of IDF forces who then, the people were provoking them, these ISM or ISM-aligned uh, foreigners, uh, radical Israelis, and Palestinians uh, provoke the IDF forces come out uh, to confront them. They're filmed. Then it shows all over the internet. The United States comes in through that high, that chain from ISM to ISM boosters or partners in the United States to the State Department. The State Department comes in, goes to the Central Command in Israel, says, stand down. You can't do this. You have to stop. You have to confront the settler violence. And then the IDF does nothing. Then we have the olive pickers under the harvest, and they come and they attack Israelis with axes, and they're surveilling our communities. And uh, as the IDF uh, Reserve has said, you know, uh, Barry, uh, Kibbutz Berry style massacre is just a matter of time. It's being planned. It's right here in Plains View, and we're not doing anything about it because the Biden administration comes in and attacks Israel for settler violence. So that's how it all works. And then you say, well, then what's the hand that's guiding? U.S. policy in the region. And again, we go back to Paula Rudy's statement that ISM is funded by the Muslim Brotherhood and specifically by Hamas Central Committee member who operates in Europe. So it's all very pretty. We've tied it up in a nice little bow. And we see the line from Hamas to the State Department to the IDF. And we wonder how we got into this pickle. Well, here's an example of how we got into the situation we're in. And now we just have to cut this Gordian knot and annihilate Hamas and move on. And it would be fantastic, for instance, if the United States could stop uh, collaborating with them. Oh, just one tiny little, little, little thing. Uh, so when I, was in, uh, when I was looking at this, I also found out one more thing, which is that beginning in, uh, in August, the State Department began funding a new organization in Gaza uh, that's part of Gaza University. It's called the Phoenix Center for Research and Field Studies. And they are, believe it or not, an adjunct organization of Islamic Jihad, which is the Iranian-Palestinian terrorist organization and Hamas's junior partner in Gaza. And they're also claiming that they're holding some of the Israelis that were taken hostage on October 7th and were absolutely engaged in the slaughter of October 7th. So that's nice. So the United States has given them, they pledged beginning in August, around $100,000 to two media programs put out by the Phoenix Center for Research and Field Studies at Gaza University that is an adjunct of Islamic Jihad. So that's another thing that Congress can investigate. But those are the only details I'm going to give you today. You're going to have to wait uh, for the next in focus for more. We'll leave it there. See you soon. Take care.